Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back after a long, hot summer. Good to see you all. Before we start, I would like to extend my our best wishes to all the grandparents who might be here because it's Grandparents' Day, um, and I hope you uh, all of your grandparents uh, enjoy your grandchildren uh, until they reach a certain age, of course. Um, and I would also like to, uh, I don't think we need any reminder, but tomorrow is, is the anniversary of 9-11. And so um, if you would join us in keeping all of those who passed away and the families of those who passed away on 9-11 in your thoughts and prayers, especially tomorrow, <clears throat> I know um, personally, um, and I'm gonna make this personal, but I lost 23 students, former students in 9-11. Um, so it was, um, it was a little bit shock shocking to me personally to, to lose all of those students who were working in, either in the fire department, police department, or uh, working in the towers. So we remind them very much. And then finally, I'd like to uh, wish all of our Jewish brothers and sisters uh, a uh, blessed and prosperous new year, which will begin next Friday night. Um, and so our discussion today will center around the Jewish high holidays. Um, and of course, uh, I'm not the expert on that. My colleague Rabbi Gotti is. So I'm going to introduce him and I'm going to really start with him, uh, ask him a question, where in scripture, where in Jewish literature uh, and Jewish scriptures, where and what is the foundation for these holy days and, and what do they mean? I do know that Jews celebrate what, four New Year's during the year? There, there are four New Year's, so he'll explain all of that. So. I'm going to ask Adi to, to take the lead on that, and then I'll keep throwing questions at him, and he'll question me, and we'll all have a good time. Okay. I think maybe if you move the microphone a little bit, uh, maybe to the center, kind of, although if you're going to face me. Yeah, there we go. That's okay, that's okay. better. So um, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for coming. So the high holidays uh, are upon us. And actually, last night, I'll start with, with last night. Um, last night, we started with the first ceremony or the first ritual um, of the high holiday season. So last night, we said supplication, um, at least in the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish tradition. Uh, we, uh, I, because this is a, an Ashkenazi synagogue here. Uh, we start the slichot, the supplication, at least four days before Rosh Hashanah. So, but it has to be on Saturday night. So if Saturday night is less than four days before Rosh Hashanah, you move it uh, backward. So this year, Rosh Hashanah is on Friday. So this Saturday night was when we did it. So two questions that will give a good uh, introduction to Rosh Hashanah. So <clears throat> we start with supplications. So what does that mean? It means that this is the theme of the season. Supplication is to do tshuva, to return to something that we were originally in um, that state, and somehow we want to return to it. And of course, that is the state of holiness, state of life, and we'll elaborate on these uh, in a little in a little bit. But that's the first theme: the supplications. The reason that we do it at least four days before Rosh Hashanah that explains the other theme of uh, of Rosh Hashanah that is related, and the theme is life. So we want to return to 
uh, give supplications to the creator of the world and to our community, goes hand in hand, and therefore return to life. Ask God to not cut off our lives. So the second theme is the idea of um, who will live and who will die this year. And who by fire, who by water, um, <clears throat> we say that God is the decisor in the beginning of the year. On Rosh Hashanah, he already decides who's going to live and who's going to die and in which way. But with supplications, perhaps we can, if it's, a, if it's something that um, God wanted to punish us for something, that maybe we can evade the, uh, the punishment somehow, the decree through supplication. But it has to be for sincere supplication. And that is the link between wanting more life and uh, the idea that uh, Rosh Hashanah is, uh, um, is when we clean our heart, just like we clean our home for Passover, uh, you know, from the chametz, from the leaven. This is the same idea. We clean our heart and we want God to give us a new heart or circumcise our heart. Um, in this uh, high holiday, the days of awe, the 10 days of awe, um, four days before is because we are like the lamb that the Israelites took in Egypt before Passover. They had to, to hold the, the lamb for four days for different reasons to show the Egyptians that they're not afraid of them. They're not going to just slaughter their idle and run away but mainly because this was a sacrifice and it was the first offering that the people of Israel have given to God and of course that offering has to be uh, pure right? it has to be unblemished so you have to hold it at least for four days to see that it's an unblemished uh, sacrifice so maybe something that you missed on the first day, you'll see on the second day and so forth. So same way, we are now looking at ourselves for at least four days to be able to bring ourselves as a, uh, an offering to God on the altar. And God decides, is it going to be um, to be slaughtered or be spared? So this is the, um, the theological uh, level of it. We believe that God created the world on that day. We say this is the day that God gave birth to the world. And it's one of the Rosh Hashanah, as Don said, that basically every season is uh, more or less is a new year because it starts a new cycle for something. Rosh Hashanah is the uh, beginning of the year for kings, for kingship. So what it means is that we have to give our taxes to the creator of heaven, the ultimate king, but also to the king on earth. So this was actually the tax year. This was the, the tithing. And everything that grew before or any fruit that uh, emerged before goes to the previous year. And then anything after goes to the next. So it's like the April 15 for, for us. So you gave, uh, and in, if I uh, use a New Testament reference, is that you give uh, the king what it do, right? Right. Um, give Caesar to, to Caesar, Caesar, right? You give to Caesar what is due to Caesar, and you give to the uh, King in heaven one what it uh, what it requires or he requires. So um, that's what we do. It's it's a time. It's time for accounting, the soul searching, and uh, you have to go to the bottom of things. Uh, 
you know, when you go and you have to do a root canal, if if you're not going to go all the way to the root, you just spent two thousand dollars and you didn't get what you needed, right? So you have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity here um, to do um, that cleanup, that uh, um, that root canal. So that's that's the idea um, of Rosh Hashanah on a theological level and the practical level. Yeah, it's it's interesting that we can speak about four days of supplication and so on. It just two things just struck me that both in Christianity, at least in the the Catholic orientation of Christianity, and in many of the Protestant churches too, um, there, there. What is important is that we have time to prepare. You know, it's it's uh, in, in Christianity we have the four weeks of Advent to prepare for Christmas. Right. We have the six weeks in Lent to prepare for the three great days uh, of, of uh, uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, um, because they're preparations for events, important events. Um, and I don't think what 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 has strikes me anyway is we don't take those days of preparation too seriously. On the, anymore uh, and it's a shame because it it the other thing that comes to mind when Dottie was sit, speaking is the language that we use the language of religion right, is the language of imagery and by using those images uh, we somehow try to connect with the reality that's going to go on. Right? So if, for example, in Christianity, uh, we start Lent with Ash Wednesday. Right? Now there's six weeks of preparation towards the, the feasts of, of around Easter. But you have the sign, for example, of ashes. Well, what is that a sign of? What does that remind us of? Does it bring us back to a certain reality that faces us? Right? And I can go on more about that. Uh, but, you know, Gadi also mentioned the idea of going down. And Christianity, uh, whether we believe it or not, and, and regardless of what so many of these tele television ministers are preaching on, on a weekend, all right, Christianity is a religion of descent, not ascent, all right? We have the image, the old baptismal rite in the early church was you went down into the baptismal pool. You were going down into a grave. You were baptized, and then you came out the other side, a new person. So, it's very important, I think, for us to understand that in these days of, of chuva or of repentance, whatever we want to call them, right, we're, we're called upon to empty ourselves. And again, that's a very, very important concept of, of this whole idea. And why? You know, it's very hard for people today to let go of things, you know, we're a, we're a we're a people of possession of consumer of consuming things, and as religious people, and we do know, for example, that Christianity is definitely a religion of of um, a paradox. The seed has to be planted in the ground for it to die and then grow. Okay. So there are those elements that are involved in what we will celebrate with our Jewish brothers and sisters next week. There are parallels within uh, Christianity uh, yeah. also. Yeah. So, Even though um, your season is in the spring, but we have that season too, the Passover. It's, uh, 
it's parallel and it's actually exactly six months from uh, Passover. So it really is the twice a year that we have that uh, cleanup, the spring cleanup and the uh, and the fall cleanup. So the fall is more kind of a spiritual one and, uh, and the spring is physical too. So I um, want to touch about uh, on two things that uh, Don said. First of all, it's a reminder for something. So every holiday in the in on the Jewish calendar um, is a reminder for something. So in general, all the holidays follow the agricultural year cycle of the year, and God speaks to us through His creation. So the commandments that we fulfill connect us to the land. And I have to say, um, I just came back from a big trip to um, Alaska and, and Hawaii. And in those two places, there's a very important relationship with the land. The land is something sacred that, as they say in Alaska, the, the lower 48, um, we kind of maybe forgot about it. They said, um, on the in the lower 48, man big, uh, nature small. In Alaska, nature big, man small. And really, this is the idea that we need to connect to. The Rosh Hashanah is a reminder that we are mortals. And if for some reason we have forgotten about it, um, this is a reminder because even if we sometimes are ailing and uh, in advanced age, people don't necessarily think about it all the time, not necessarily in the sense of writing a will. You need to write a will, but you also need to write a spiritual will. And you don't know if this year is going to be your last year or your last day. So just as we are in a hurry or we feel the sense of urgency to prepare our financial will after we die, Rosh Hashanah comes to tell us that um, even more urgently is our spiritual will. What do you stand for? What do we stand for? And do we understand that we are small, nature big? And the more we understand that, um, the better we will be. Why? Because it's a lot of burden to carry uh, when you think you are big, right? And you carry a lot of stuff that may not be yours either. And you need to kind of get rid of it. And that's the other thing that Don mentioned is the vessel. You need, we are vessels and we are, we come in front of God to renew ourselves. And we say, God, just as we are giving you and paying you the taxes now on the first of the year, you have to give us our budget. So the budget that we receive and literally in our theology in the in the in the liturgy it says that god literally chops life he cuts pieces of life for us and for each person and he examines us one by one and then he decides this stays this goes this gets another piece of life but if we come as a full vessel already then you can't put anything new in it. So the more we empty our vessels, the better um, renewed we will be and a new budget. Um, the example I like to give is uh, the story with Alicia, who was later was uh, Elijah's uh, assistant. He, where he lived and prophesied, he went by this town all the time. And this woman said to him, if you pass by here all the time, why don't you um, come here every time you pass by, you stop for the night, I'll make you a little uh, a room, a little pied de terre, and you can stop for the night and then continue. And she 
um, did that. And one day, so he lived there when, when he uh, passed by. And one day, creditors, her creditors came to take her two sons to be slaves because she had a debt that she couldn't pay. So she went to Elisha and she said, what do I do? And Elisha asked her, what do you do for a living? He didn't even know what she does for a living. And she said, we make oil. And then he said, okay, then bring all the empty vessels you have in the house that you can find. And I will fill them with oil. And you will uh, create that miracle that you'll fill them up. So she brought all the empty vessels that she had, and he filled them all. Had she brought more empty vessels, he would have filled them as well. So God can fill us as much as we empty ourselves. There is a, uh, a phrase and a theme that repeats itself during the, the days of Rosh well, Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And it's the um, 13 attributes of God when God meets Moses um, at the nook of the, of, of the mountain um, after the sin of the golden calf. Moses doesn't want the people to be destroyed in God's wrath. And he goes and he prays for 40 days and he gives supplications. And this is where we also get the 40 days of supplication. So, and he wants to see God's face. And God says, I can't, you'll see my, my back. But then when he passes over Moses in the in the nook of, of the mountain, he said, um, I forgave you as you said, or I forgive you according to your uh, speech. In Hebrew, you can uh, interpret it in different ways. But one of the beautiful teachings about it um, is not just that God adheres to uh, Moses' supplications and requests for the people to... Um, to, to remain he also God tells him I will forgive as you as much as you forgive others so this is a phrase that we use to say the more you empty yourself right you forgive others you're willing to not hold on to say to, to old grudge if you can that you can't always and there's a process to everything and you can't just let go uh, in any situation, but whatever you can, you should let go, and then, as much as you emptied, God will fill them. Yeah, it, it's ironic that not ironic, but it's 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 an interesting parallel in with Christianity in the sense that as often as we say the Lord's Prayer, one of the elements in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses or debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. All right? So we will receive forgiveness to the degree that we are willing to forgive others. But it's also very interesting, stay with the theme of forgiveness for a moment. People who are able to forgive are people who have been forgiven for something. It's a very, very interesting parallel in one's life in terms of experience. Right? Because the other thing we have to remember is that we can become very, very intellectual and concept conceptual regarding our religion on, of, of God and so on and so forth. But the, the key element for those who want to go deeper, remember I said that religion is is, is, is an act of descent, of going down. For those of us who want to go deeper, those conceptual, intellectual elements right, in some way have to come, in one way or another, experience. Because for us, right, it's the experience that we have of God in our lives that will move us to perpetuate God's action in life. So if you are loved and feel love, you are more prone to 
to open yourselves to love others. So um, I, I think that that's a very, very important important elements in terms of both religions as we as we approach these important days of repentance, chuva, whatever you want to call them, redemption, and so on. Um, the the other element that I think is very important for at least for me uh, as a, as a Christian. Okay, it's having come to the realization, and this is late in life, okay, that God doesn't have a past. I think we so worry about things that we did in our past life. Right? God, everything with God is present. And so you and I are always present in the given moment all right, to God and God to us. What happened in our past make us who we are today. So, in that sense, that when we come to these important seasons of repentance and shuva and so on, it's important for us to understand what we're being called to. Right? And of course, in Christianity, you know, the, in, in St. Mark's Gospel, Jesus' first words were repent. And I think over the years, we have kind of misinterpreted what that word means. Uh, the word repent means to turn yourself around. It, it's a, it comes from a, a Greek word, metanoia, to change one's mind. So the idea of, of repentance for us, for Christians in this season, right, is to somehow do things that will help us turn ourselves around. And, and what I like to say is, since Christians are rooted in the person of Christ, right, and Christ was known as the man for others, then repentance for a Christian means, and I think it got, we've talked about this last night as we were discussing uh, in our discussion, um, turning yourself around from being other-centered from being self-centered to other-centered. Okay. So this is this is kind of what is important for us as Christians during this period that we celebrate in parallel form with uh, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters. Yeah. And the process that we go through to return to is to return to our human nature, that we are uh, finite. And it's interesting because we think that spirituality, we go directly to heaven, right? We have to look at heaven all day. Actually, in a Jewish way, we have to look at earth a lot to reach the uh, to reach heaven. It's because the the gate to heaven is through earth, and how we treat earth and the relationship we have with with earth. Um, so Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are a process of, of connecting to that place, that we are small. So we start with Rosh Hashanah and we acknowledge the king. That's the, as we said, this is the, the beginning of the year for kings. So we literally start the service with the word, the king. And then through the 10 days, we get to Yom Kippur where we shed basically every uh human desire for we suspend those desires for 25 hours not eating not uh, bathing not engaging in uh any uh basically fun stuff so um we it, we act like it's a day of mourning so we really are connected to that place and what is that place and, and actually this trip also reminded me of that in order to be more like godly on earth we need to act more like animals and i'm sure you are now 
in your mind are jumping up and saying, what did I hear? More like animals, we should be taking example from animals. Absolutely, first of all, animals are here to teach us um, things. But what is common to all animals, birds, fish, mammals, everything, one thing is in common. They will never consume more than they need to. If we did that, that's the way to heaven. That's the gate to heaven. You know, on the steps going up to the throne in, um, in uh, not Isaiah, in uh, Ezekiel's vision, he sees steps and he sees um, animals on each step. And those, ste those animals are called the holy animals. Because each animal teaches us something in this world. And when we look at them, we're supposed to, uh, to learn. But all of them together teach us the bottom line of the prayer of our Father, but also the whole idea of the manna in the desert, when God gives us the manna for one day. He says, you have to trust, to believe. Manna comes from the word emunah, faith. Believe that God will provide you for the next day. Don't hoard. Don't take other people's property just because you don't believe and you are afraid that you will not have and God will not provide for you. And that's the lesson. It's the lesson that can connect us between our relationship uh, man and God and man and man. That we are, we give each other space. We give the land time to rest so we don't consume all the time. So we care about God's creation that is our vehicle to God and to the practice of all the commandments to show God that we um, can curb ourselves and believe that God will provide tomorrow. It, it, again, it, it, the, the wonderful thing about parallels, God was talking about being like the animals. Um, within Christianity, and I know there's a big debate going on, Gotti and I have fun throwing some things back and forth, but we as Christians believe that the great miracle was that God took human form in the person of Jesus. We call that the incarnation, the enfleshment of God. And one of the perspectives that has changed me from the time I was growing up, from a perception that, as I said, I grew up with, is that Jesus did not come was not sent to die. Jesus was not plan B. That somehow, right, what God was telling us, first of all, somebody raised this question at, at a, a conference I was at one day, and he said, what is God's dream for you? What's God's dream for you? And the answer is, to be in a relationship with me and one another. So if that's what God's dream is, then what is the purpose of, of Jesus coming to earth, taking human form? And I'm convinced when people say, what was Jesus all about? To me, he was about showing us what it means to be fully human. Because in being fully human, you have, as he was, you have an intimate relationship with God. It's not separate, okay? It's, it's intertwined. And in being fully human, the more human become in that you, the more human you become in that sense, the more divine you become. Can I ask you though a question? Is it, <clears throat> you have to become more human, but in the way that 
God intended oh, you absolutely. to be. That's that's why I said before, part of being human is the ability to let go. So you, and, and, it, and it sounds funny, especially in today's day and age, where you become nothing. But the interesting part is the more we become nothing, the more capable we are of receiving everything from God. Okay, just like the uh, the vessels that Alicia filled. God comes and he fills up. You know, it's pe people, again, when I was growing up, we had this, this image that we, we had to grow up and, and be as strong as a piece of marble. The only problem with that is marble doesn't have any cracks in it. And if you don't have any cracks in it, there's no way the grace of God can penetrate. You know, so we used to joke over the fact that rather than being a piece of marble, we got to grow up and be like Swiss cheese. You know, the fact that there are holes in us that need to be filled, and we can only fill them with the grace of God. And the the beautiful thing of being in a relationship with God is, and Gotti was talking about faith. God always takes the initiative, just the way he did with the manna in the desert. God always takes the initiative. So that is what we are putting our faith in. So when Jesus comes, he comes to preach the arrival of the kingdom of God. So how are you and I supposed to relate to being part of the kingdom of God, not totally fulfilled, but on the way, because we fulfill it by changing our lives around and becoming more and more what we would say Christ-like, putting on the mind of Christ. This is how you become more and more human. Right. So um, these are the kind of the main um, themes of, of Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur. And there is a question, an interesting question that have been asked uh, have been asked in the in the past. Um, why, in this case, if um, if the idea is to kind of cleanse ourselves and uh, come in front of the heavenly court, shouldn't we wash first and then come in front of the king? We're kind of doing it in reverse. Rosh Hashanah is when we come in front of the king in the heavenly court, and then we have Yom Kippur when we cleanse ourselves. Why not the opposite? Shouldn't it be first fast, repent, and then go into the into the uh, palace? So it's a good question. Um, the answer is kind of. Uh, it's a twofold answer. It, one, um, yes, you can do that. But then if you don't acknowledge the, the king in heaven or the heavenly court, then um, why would you want to search your heart and your soul? If you're not accountable to anybody, then, then it doesn't matter. So you first have to say, yeah, there's April 15 that I have to give I uh, have to, to write a check to the government. Maybe they'll reimburse me at the end. They'll give me, uh, you know, I'll get a check back. But first I have to uh, do my accounting. So, and then I can come clean. So that's the uh, idea. And the second thing is, um, Rosh Hashanah is more of a public uh, holiday even though we gather, of course, on Yom Kippur too. But Rosh Hashanah is um, when we come together and we say we all are responsible for this. We're all witnessing your recreation as a community. And then we go into the individual. And Yom Kippur is really, yes, we're supposed to ask for forgiveness between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur of anybody that you know that you might have offended because it says that God will forgive us for all the sins 
but not sins that occurred between people. He'll forgive the sins you committed against God, but not uh, against each other. We, this we have to ask for forgiveness from each other. So we first have to acknowledge our the system that we work in, the the government or the the king, right? And then um, we file our taxes. Um, one more interesting question that people ask about the holidays, the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we say in public, uh, we list all the the list of uh, offenses, of sins that we might have committed, and we say it in, in plural. So we say, we have sinned, we have committed these sins, and, and we do a whole list um, of, uh, uh, of that. So the question is, but, you know, I didn't, uh, let's say, steal this year, or I didn't... Uh, commit uh, adultery or I didn't uh, you know cheat in uh, in my tithing so uh, why do I have to say that in in public so again here there are two sides to the answer one is you know if we're going to be a community then we don't want to embarrass people can you imagine if we just let people who stole this year. Okay, everybody who stole, get up and say, I stole. Everybody who, uh, you know, committed adultery, stand up. So that wouldn't be, right, um, nice to do. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, yes, maybe we personally did not commit those, uh, all the list of sins, but, or transgressions, but still, we are part of the community. And if other people somehow were driven to commit uh, all these transgressions, maybe somewhere we have some responsibility in this, that maybe somebody came to us and asked for help, and we didn't give them enough help, uh, or we did it begrudgingly, and they, did, they went away, and then they had to then cheat on their taxes you know, or steal. So do we have some responsibility in it? Maybe. So this is kind of the idea is to come as a community and work our way um, to the individual. That's another important message. Yeah, I, I think it's important, especially in today's day and age when it's become so blatantly clear of how individualistic society has become it's all about me my truth my reality nothing else and yet when you're dealing with the um, the, the the ideas and and the being of both judaism and christianity you can't understand either one of those religions without understanding the need for community christians Christians have a, a term that they use uh, and, and, and call what we call the church, the body of Christ, or the people of God. And one of the images of the church that came out of Vatican II, that the church is a pilgrim, always in process, always needing to be reformed. That Actually, if you want to talk the words of salvation, right, that you and I need one another to help us get to what we would call being saved. Right? For, if we don't look out for one another and we just look out for ourselves, we're missing out on the whole perspective of what Christianity is all about and what Judaism is all about. We're in process. We're in community. And the element of community, which I notice to a large extent today, if you, if you use the expression, if we are a real, in, in a real community, if something happens, the expression is, few are guilty, all are responsible. 
And it's an element that if you don't understand how we are connected to one another, that particular saying goes right out the window. Right? How can I be responsible for X, Y, and Z? All right? we're, we're quick to blame somebody else. But as we see in today's society, all right, we're click, quick to blame somebody else. But if we remain silent, then where does the responsibility on our part come in? So being a member of a community of believers, right? and and you know what 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 I would say is that if we are people of faith, see to me the difference between faith and belief, I, I make this distinction a lot. Belief to me is something that you deal with from the neck up, but faith is something that is totally personal. It's, it's a personal commitment on your part to someone or something. And if we, as a community, right, are a community of faith, then we see reality as Christians, we see reality and interpret reality through the filter of Jesus. And if that's our filter to understand reality, then we're called upon to deal with ourselves in terms of that reality. So um, both of these religions are, are elements or are, are more than images, are realities that stand against individualism, that we are a community, that we move as a community, that we believe as a community. Mm -hmm. right. But a community is not, it, it, with the, and you know what it's like living in community. You live here. You know what this community is like. There are differences of opinion and so on and so forth. Any community, but it's, it's the living together in community that moves us on. And that is so true with these two, uh, what I would say, great religions that, that Gotti and I represent. The idea of community is absolutely essential. Yeah, that really is the the bottom line of of that. That we are part of a bigger thing, um, creation, community, and we have just have a, a a part of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, if maybe if people have some questions. Does anybody have any a questions few, they want to throw at us? Ten minutes. Being or, more specific to what Gotti is saying in terms of the, the holidays or things yeah, that I, I say. see one hand, Jack. Uh, the the sins? No, the New Year's. Oh, the New Year. Um, so Passover is a is a New Year. Um, and that's the the month of the of the spring. Usher, uh, again, it's a it's a um, all of them revolve around the agricultural cycle, right? So, in what we're doing here, we'll end with the first with the second harvest, right? There's the first harvest and the second harvest. So, uh, when we do. The, the spring is kind of a before the first harvest, Shavuot, when we count the 49 days from Passover to the Feast of Weeks, right? That really is the counting to the first uh, harvest. And then um, the, the fall is the second harvest. And in between, we have the birthday of the trees and uh, the birthday of uh, um, it's not the it's not the birthday, but again, it's for another uh, tithing, second tithing. So each um, each season has its uh, purpose. Yeah. Um. 
Well, obviously, maybe we should repeat the question oh, yeah. actually for people who wouldn't hear it online. Is there any corollary between what Gotti said and, and the Christian seasons? Um, first of all, we have to understand that from a religious perspective, just as, as in Judaism, that the Christian New Year begins on the first Sunday of Advent. All right, four year, four weeks before before Christmas, right. uh, and that's the, the, we we don't go by the season so much as as we do by or or uh, we we go through what we call liturgical seasons, things that we celebrate. So there's the 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 Advent season, the Christmas season, the season of Epiphany, the season of what we call ordinary time the Easter season, Pentecost season, and then the longest season of the year is what we call ordinary time, where we celebrate the ordinary workings of the relationship between God and us. Right? Um, the, and the other, the interesting thing too, in terms of, of the theology and the liturgy, um, and, and this kind of riles me every year when when I see people with Christmas trees on the top of their cars on the day after Thanksgiving, and then those same Christmas trees are on the curb the day after Christmas. We have lost a sense of celebrating holidays. We somehow think the celebration of, of, of a holiday comes before. And the interesting element within the liturgical seasons in, 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 in uh, at least in Christianity, uh, there's, a, there's an old saying that every great holiday has its octave. And you all know what an octave is, it's eight days. So in understanding the, if, you, if we end up preparing for Christmas for four weeks and then throw out the Christmas tree, well, put the baby on the, on the curb the day after Christmas, what are we celebrating? The, all, the idea is you, you prepare yourselves, just as with Lent. You prepare yourselves for a great celebration and then celebrate. You, sell, you, you know, we've heard the song 12 Days of Christmas. Well, what do you think that means? It's the celebration of Christmas for 12 days. So, Again, in terms of a calendar, we don't speak of it in an agricultural way. We speak about it in a liturgical way, in, in, at least in Catholicism. Yeah, do. I guess because at that point, uh, I'm just looking at it historically, Christianity developed together with rabbinic Judaism in right. the first century, um, right around the time of exile anyway, that... Jews did not really work the land for a long time. You know, and then it started a 2000 year diaspora that mainly Jews were not workers of the land. They have been different places in the world. But again, there are certain things that you're obligated um, in terms of tithing and counting, um, like the Omer, the 49 days, and you have to give certain amount uh, from the dough that you make, but only from a dough that was made from flour from the land of Israel. So um, we kind of lost that connection that came at the same time of Christianity. So it went to more of the metaphorical part of it. But Judaism, especially now with the modern state of Israel, that Jews return to be workers of the land and, and that specific land, all these questions are back. And it's interesting because when I was in, uh, in Maui, uh, I actually led services in Maui uh, two weeks ago when I was there. Um, I was planning my trip there before the fires. And it turns out a good friend of mine who was a rabbi there for a while was just leaving. And they asked me if I would fill in when I was there. But um, there was a, a member of the congregation there that said something about the land that um, kind of completed an idea for me. And it really was interesting. He said, um, 
you know, because theologically, God keeps telling us that if you do the right thing in my eyes and follows my follow my uh, commandment, I will give you ample rain and it's time and the land will pr produce and everything kind of the, the blessings will come through the land. And I thought for many years, yes, it, these are covenant, it's a conditional relationship. You follow my commandments and I'll keep you on the land. This is love and the, and, and the, and the covenant um, are irrevocable, but the relationship uh, could be conditional. You know, I don't want to see you now or go away and come back later. But what the man said there, part of he was a part of that community there. And of course they work the land there and they're very connected uh, to the land in, in Hawaii. And they, he said, it's not just that we fulfill the commandment and God reciprocates. Actually, as Jews, we need to be indigenous with the land. And again, not to borrow necessarily that term from being indigenous uh, in the Middle East and so forth, but it's it's being indigenous with the land, one with the land, and so it 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 automatically produces back because you respect it, you go with the, the right season, you allow it to to rest on the sabbatical year. There are all these things of giving to the poor and not consume everything. Educate yourself to be more animal-like and only consume what you need. And then, of course, nature and creation will respond automatically, indigenously. It was a fascinating idea that I will be talking about this year um, on the holiday. <music>